I know we've uh, looked into a number of the world's languages. People hear that in school and elsewhere. Lots of people believe in Hinduism. But let's take it from a perspective of its validity. The perspective of the normative rules of language, context, and logic. I don't, I had a discussion with a lady and she says, well, that's what you believe and I believe differently. And I'm arguing with a woman who's a Christian, but she has her point of view. And I said, well, my point of view doesn't count and yours doesn't count. What counts is the validity of the writings, the Bible in this case, or the Hindu writings. So we take a look at that. So, Ankerberg and Weldon, the uh, co-author of the Encyclopedia of New Age Beliefs, and the introduction here, he says, they, they, the four Vedas are the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajra Veda, and the Atharva Veda. I pronounced them right. They are divided into two parts, the work portion, basically polytheistic ritual, and the knowledge portion, philosophical speculation. This latter portion comprises what is called Upanishads, or Vedanta, since they brought to a close each of the four Vedas, the Upanishads came to be spoken of as often as the Vedanta, Danta, the Anta, or end of the Vedas, well, it's whatever that means. The Vedas are mostly a collection of ritualistic hymns to various Hindu gods. The Rig Veda comprises the foremost collection of these hymns, and the Yajur Veda is a collection of various mantras or special words used to evoke occult, occult power. The Sama Veda combines verses from the Rig Veda to melodic chants. The Atharvavava Veda is basically a collection of occult spell incantations and hymns. Exotic stuff. The Vedas are really the Bible of Hinduism. They can be divided into Samhitas, Brahmanas, Aranakas, and Upanishads. The only 108 Upanishads remain, and <coughs> of these, 10 are of central importance. They are the Cha, Kena, Katha, Prasma, Mandaka, Mandukaya, Chandaga, Brahmandara Inaka, Ariya, and Tata Ira. Great to me. As for the Upanishads themselves are concerned, their variety of thought has allowed considerable latitude in their interpretation. So that scriptural orthodox has not led to a single viewpoint. <laughs> Thus, Hindu metaphysicians range in their adherence from theism to atheism. Well, wow. and there's more. So the Gita is not inerrant. No errors. How can you go with something that's so unreliable from the beginning, see? The Gita is an episode of the great epic Mahabharata, which narrates the dialogue of Arjuna, one of the five sons of the Pandava family, with the Hindu god Krishna, an avatar of Vishnu. A major battle is about to begin in which Arjuna has a horrible assignment, that of fighting against his relatives, the Karava family. Caught between duty as a warrior and the morality of fighting against his cousins, between his social duty and the threat of karma, he chooses not to fight and to be killed rather than to have his conscience stained by the killing of his relatives. At this moment, Krishna reveals himself to the distressed warrior and helps him understand the situation from a transcendental point of view. He performs the spiritual exegesis of Arjuna, Arjuna's situation, stating, not by abstaining from work can one achieve freedom from karma, nor by renunciation alone can one attain perfection. Abstaining from work is practically impossible, according to Krishna. As, an, as everyone is forced to act according to the tendencies, the gunas, he has acquired from the modes of material nature. As a warrior, Arjuna must always follow his duties, in other words, his dharma. On this basis, the Gita founds a new element in Hindu philosophy. Spiritual perfection is not attained by asceticism or by abandoning action, but by giving a new meaning to action, that of detachment from its fruits. 
Such an attitude of mind does not feed trauma and reincarnation. Krishna formulates the famous principle, be focused on action and not on the fruits of action. Do not become confused in attachment to the fruit of your actions and do not become confused in a de desire for inaction. Therefore, one should not withdraw from the world of social involvement, but live in it and detach from the fruits of actions, since action is better than inaction, and renunciation of all action is impossible. This is just, wow. As a Krishna, as a result, Krishna's command to Arjuna is always act with detachment to the fruits of actions. The one who is acting without attachment attains God. This is karma yoga, the path of attaining liberation through accomplishing one's normal duties with a totally detached attitude toward personal benefit. In his given context, Arjuna has to fight no matter who is going to die on the battlefield. Wow. Walter Martin, Martin, he wrote this book, Kingdom of the Cults. I wish I still had it. He's such a great researcher. And he gives you a general ideas what some of the world's religions are. The general assumption of the Upanishads include a belief in pantheism, karmic retribution, and reincarnation. Perhaps the most well-known section of the Vedas is the Hindu epic and his charioteer Krishna who is actually the disguised incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. The Gita was written down and subsequently modified between 200 BC and AD 200. So it has indeed been changed at least once. Hence it is not inerrant and original. Note that the original text of the Bible has not changed one time. An illustration of the pluralism or contradictory nature of Hinduism is found by comparing the god of the Gita with the god of earlier Vedic literature. God is only described by the Gita as personal and often sounds even monotheistic. Only one god who is personal and not a part of creation exists. However, when one reads earlier Vedic scripture, God is presented as being definitively, def definitely pantheistic. All of existence is one, whether any divinity exists at all. The monotheistic characteristics of the Gita were appropriated by the founder of ISKCON, Hare Krishna, a modern school of Vishnu, his Hinduism, which developed from the 15th century teachings of a man named Shatanaya, who instituted worship of Vishnu as God against the prevailing local worship of Shiva. And consequently, Ishkan teaches a more monotheistic rather than pantheistic view idea of God today. How can you have any reliance on this stuff? And your life depends on it. Unlike Hinduism and all of its variations, the Bible from Genesis through Revelation has no contradictions, no changes, and is miraculously consistent without contradiction throughout. It predicts the future inherently and has no scientific, logical, geographical, spelling, grammatical flaw within its writings at all. Krishna, karma, and grace. The first difficulty in the philosophy of the Gita concerns the relation between the law of karma and the grace oriented by Krishna in helping his followers to attain liberation. On the one hand, it seems that Krishna is sovereign over the law of karma, and uses it as an instrument for punishment or reward. He thus says, those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, are perpetually cast into transmigration, into various demoniac species of life. Wow, what an awful religion. And also, those who worship me and surrender all their activities unto me, being devoted to me without hesitation, engaged in devotional service and meditating unto me, I del deliver them quickly from the ocean of birth and death. On the other hand, karma seems to be a law that functions by itself with no external control. One has to struggle alone against its tribe and, at and attain better incarnations from one existence to the next. 
God's interference with it is an artificial construct of Hindu theism. So that the Hindu com commentators of the Gita had to choose between holding to the supremacy of Krishna and the ultimate power of karma in ruling the world. <clears throat> Consequently, we have theistic and pantheistic interpretations and even translations of the Gita indebted to one or the other alternative. Those belonging to the first category see Krishna as a super personal God, using karma as an instrument for awakening humans from ignorance, while the others see him as a mere form of Brahman's manifestation, with no real power in controlling karma. The two positions contradict each other, and the Gita leaves enough room for both sides. Now the view of grace in the Gita is a far cry from the meaning it acquired later in the Prapati devotional trend. Wow. Absolute inconsistency here. The teaching of Krishna as sovereign God and the periodical creation of the world contradict one another. Another inconsistency of the Gita is regarding the character of Krishna. According to classic Vaishnavism, Krishna is only an incarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu, which according to Ven Vedanta is only a form of Brahman's manifestation. In the Gita, Krishna is called the Supreme Lord of the Universe, eternal, and the source of all existence. I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. He is said to not only be not only the creator, but also the substance of the universe. Contrary to Vedanta, Krishna becomes the source of Brahma, Brahman. Contrary to Vaishnavism, he is the instrument of attaining fusion with Brahman. Although the intention of the Gita is to present Krishna as superpersonal, he is rather a heterogeneous mixture of theistic, dualistic, and pantheistic components. The cycle of permanent transformation between a manifested state and an unmanifested state is characteristic for Krishna, as it was for Brahman. At the end of an era, Kalpa, all creatures disintegrate into my nature, and at the beginning of another era, I manifest them again. Such it is my nature, Prakriti, to follow again and again the pattern of the infinite manifestations and disintegrations. Krishna has to follow the, the pattern of the infinite manifestations and disintegrations, Avsham, Prakrita, Vashat, literally, automatically, under the obligation of Prakriti, which implies that this process is a necessity that supersedes him as personal God. Instead of considering Krishna a genuine creator God, we should conclude that the creation of the world is not an option for him, but a periodic duty at the end of each cosmic cycle, as was the case with the manifestations of Brahman. S. Das Gupta comments on the contradictory men and personal character of Krishna. The Gita combines together different conceptions of God without feeling the necessity of reconciling the oppositions or contradictions involved in them. It does not seem to be aware of the philosophical difficulty of combining the concept of God as unmanifested, differ differenceless entity with the notion of him as the superperson who incarnates himself on earth in the human form and behaves in the human manner. It is not aware of the difficulty. If all good and evil should have emanated from God, and if there be ultimately no moral responsibility, and if everything in the world should have the same place in God, there is no reason why God should trouble or to incarnate himself as man. When there is a disturbance of the Vedic Dharma, if God is important to all, and if he is absolutely unperturbed, why should he favor the man who clings to him, and why for his sake overrule the world order of events and in his favor suspend the law of karma? Boy, give me my Bible. The Gita has a completely contradictory and unrealistic code of morality. 
When Arjuna found himself in the process of choosing between his duty as a warrior and the killing of his relatives, a severe violence